Hello and welcome to another Java tutorial. In this video we're going to have a look at how to make decisions in our programs. So what we'd like to be able to do is create programs that can have different courses of action depending maybe on some user input or depending on the value of a variable or some other event that might happen. So far all the examples that we've looked at have had a, a single kind of pathway of execution through the program and that's useful in certain situations but most of the time we like our programs to be a little bit more dynamic and flexible and be able to kind of do different things depending on different situations and that's really what we want to be able to do in this tutorial we want to be able to figure out a way of having our programs have different paths of execution depending on some situation. So to start off what we're going to do is have a look at an example really of a program that has a single pathway of execution and then once we understand what we mean by that we'll introduce a new idea of uh, introducing a conditional block into our program that will allow us to make decisions and have different pathways of execution. So to start off with, we're going to have a look at a very simple example that will have a single path of execution and then we'll change that around a little bit. So, okay, let's have a look at this simple program here. Um, it uses the scanner class, okay, uh, to read in a value. So it just reads in a value uh, using the scanner class. So we prompt the user to enter in some value and then we take that input, uh, store it in our number variable, and then we just print it back to the screen. So it's a very simple program, that's all it does. And um, we can have a look at the output of that program. Um, so for example, if we go over to our terminal window here and we just run the program, we'll see that, well, let's compile the program first. It's called example tree.java. So we'll compile that and then we'll run the program and we'll see that it just asks the user to enter in a number. So if I can maybe enter in 100 and it prints out the number you entered was 100. So it's it's a fantastic program, very useful. Um, no, not really, but anyway, it's just a little illustration of how programs execute from top to bottom in that sequential order. I mean, I can run the program again and type in a different number, maybe 600 this time, and it will say your, your, the number you entered was 600. So the output is different, but the order of execution is the same. It's still really doing the same thing. It's just outputting a different value because I input a different value. Uh, but what about if we wanted to go, take a completely different course of action? In other words, for the output to be different depending on the input. This program just won't do that. It'll do the same thing every single time we run it. So in terms of this program's course of action, um, what we can show is that the way the program actually executes is it executes from top to bottom. So the first instruction gets executed, then the second instruction, and so on and so on, all the way down to the very last instruction, this last system um, output instruction. And once that executes, then the program finishes. It's, it's done its job and it's, and it's finished. But it will do that same course of action, that same pathway through the program every single time. So um, as can be seen from that example, it executes from top to bottom. Even if the user enters in a different value, the same instructions get executed. So there's only really one pathway through the program. So what about if we take an example like this? What about if we said that we want to write a Java program that will prompt the user to enter in an integer value? And if the user enters in the value one, the program will print message one. If the user enters in the value two, the program will print message two. And if the user enters in any other value, in other words, not one and not two, any other integer value, the program will just print the message invalid number. 
So when we think about that, there's three possibilities really there. We want to enter in maybe the value one, we get message one printed to the screen. We want to enter in the value two, and we get message two printed to the screen. And then if we enter in any other number, that third option, it will just print invalid number. So how many pathways are there through this program? Well, there are really three possible outcomes, as we just said. So there are three possible pathways through the program three series of executions that can give us different results at the end. So how can we do that? Well, when we think about a program like that, we can draw a diagram to represent the different pathways through the program, often called branches, because the program gets to a certain point of execution and then branches off in a different direction, depending on some condition. So if we take that last example of entering a value of one, two, or some other number, we can actually draw a diagram, a flowchart diagram to describe how that program might execute. So we start at the start, we ask the user to enter a number. If the user enters the number one, that's a certain pathway through the program. If the user enters the number two, that's another pathway through the program. And if the user enters in any other number, then that's a third pathway through the program. So if the user enters message or enters in the value one, we output message one. If they enter the value two, we output message two. And if they enter the value, some other value, then we output the message invalid number. And then once um, that decision has been made or once that pathway through the program has executed then the program will come back to some location uh, after that decision or after that branching structure it will come back to that central kind of point again and the program will end or if there are any other instructions that need to execute then they'll get executed and the program will end. So that's the kind of structure that we'd like to be able to have, that branching structure. We're not limited to three branches, and we don't have to have three. We could have two branches, we could have three branches, we could have four branches, we could have any amount of branches off from that central point, any amount of pathways through the program that we desire. And it will depend on the problem that you're trying to solve. And, you know, uh, you can have many different branches through the program, giving you many different pathways of execution. So how do we do this in Java? Well, we have to introduce the idea of a conditional block. And a conditional block will make different decisions or will execute different statements depending on some condition. And in Java, the uh, easiest conditional block that there is to write is an if statement. And the if statement in Java allows us really to write that conditional block, make decisions, and create different pathways through our program. The syntax for an if statement in Java looks a little bit like this. We have uh, the word if, and then in brackets, we have some kind of condition. Now, the condition that we have in an if statement is actually a Boolean expression. And we've dealt with Boolean expressions in the previous video. So check back through the playlist and you'll see a video that deals with Boolean expressions. So each condition or each branch of the if statement will have a condition attached to it. And if that condition evaluates to true, then the associated code with that particular branch or that block will get executed. So in the example that we have here, we have if b1, um, then we have a block of code associated with that called s1, and that will get executed. And then the next part of that if statement is else if. So in this next part of the if statement, it's giving us an other, another branch or another possible pathway through the program, and we signify that with an else if. And we can have as many else ifs as we want and then the last um, statement in the if block is an else and that else statement is kind of like a catch-all so if none of the other conditional blocks in the statement got executed and if we have an else at the end the else will get executed so it's like a default 
kind of uh, pathway through the program. You don't have to have an else at the end. Not all conditional blocks will have an else at the end. This one does um, because of the program that we want to write. So if the user enters in one, we're going to output the message, message one. If the user enters in the value two, we're going to output the message, message two. If the user enters in any other value, which will be caught by an else part of the if statement, then we'll just print invalid number. So we're going to take this structure, this if statement structure, and we're going to introduce a conditional block into our program that will allow us to make decisions. So um, if we take this uh, example that we looked at a few minutes ago, we can modify this a little bit and <clears throat> we can introduce that if block into the program. So, okay. Uh, we already have the scanner class set up. We already have an integer number, a variable set up, and uh, we've already created the scanner <coughs> uh, class so that we'll be able to take some input. So, okay, let, let's uh, ask the user for some input. So we're going to prompt the user to please enter a number. And then uh, we'll use the scanner class to say in.nextInt. So we'll take some input from the user. And then what we want to do, well, depending on the input that the, the user has given us, we'll want to do one of three things. If it's a one that the user has entered, we'll print message one. If it's a two, we'll print message two. If it's some other number, then we'll print invalid number. So this is really where our if block or our if uh, statement needs to go. So we'll say if statement goes here. Okay, so how do we write it? Well, the syntax is given to us there on the slide. So we'll say if, and then we have some condition. Okay, so the first condition is if the number that the user has entered is one. So the, the way we'll say that as a condition for this if statement is if number equals equals one. Remember, equals equals is equivalent to, so if the number that the user has entered is equivalent to one, well then what do we want to do? Well, we want to output a message that says message one. So it'll be a system out. I'll just copy my system out from down here, um, just to save me a bit of time. And we will output um, message one. That's what we want to do. Okay, so I'm not gonna have uh, an output here at the end, or actually, do you know what, I'm, I'm gonna keep that and I'll just say end of program. <clears throat> and we can actually just output, why don't we just output end of program, end of program here. So that you'll see that the conditional block will execute and then the program will finish. So going back to our if statement. So we have an if, that's the way the if statement starts off. It starts with an if. And then the next branch that we want, or the next possibility, is um, an else if. So we'll say else if number equals equals two. So else if the number that the user has entered is equivalent to two. So that's the next possibility. And we don't have to take them in that order. We could have done two first, then followed by one, but it just makes sense to do one first and then two. But always remember the very first conditional block is an if, then followed by a number of else ifs that will depend on the amount of branches or the amount of pathways through your program. And then the very last part of the if statement is an else. And remember also, there may not always be an else, depends on what you're trying to do. So uh, if the user has entered in the number two, we want to print message two. And here's where the else comes in, because in this uh, little example, if the user enters in any other number, so not a one, not a two, but any other number, then we want to print invalid number. So this is where the else part comes in. Uh, and in this case, we want to just print invalid message or invalid number. So I'll change my message here to invalid number. 
Okay, so let's just go back over our code here and see what we have. So we use the scanner class where we have a variable here called uh, int number. Um, I just initialized that to zero at the beginning. Uh, we're going to use the scanner. We're going to prompt the user to enter in a number. So here's the code that will do that. We'll wait for the user to enter in a number and hit the return key. And here's our conditional block. Have a look at this. So there's our if statement, our very first if statement. And in the if statement, it starts off with an if. And we have our condition or our criteria, if you like, I suppose, for the first branch. So this condition is really a Boolean expression. Each condition on the if statement will be a Boolean expression that will evaluate to true or false. So if this expression evaluates to true, if number actually is one, if the user has entered in a one, then this piece of code that's part of that conditional block will get executed. So the message one will be printed to the screen. So if that's the case, the message, message one gets printed to the screen. And then what happens is we basically skip over the rest of the if statement and we go down to the next statement that needs to get executed. So if one of these branches evaluates to true, it gets executed and then that's it. We don't bother evaluating any of the other blocks in the if statement. However, if this particular first part of the if statement doesn't get executed, if the number that the user has entered in is not equal to a one, then we actually execute this, uh, or we evaluate the next part of the if statement. So this else if will execute, and we'll check to see if the number is equal to two. So it's still kind of doing it in a top-down fashion. Uh, if number is equal to two, then this message will get printed to the screen. And uh, if that isn't the case, if number is not equal to two, then we'll fall into this else part of the if statement here. So if the, if the first condition isn't met, if the second condition isn't met, we will definitely go into this else part here and um, we'll print invalid number. And then once that happens, the next uh, statement in the program will be executed. So it's important to note that these statements, this one, the message one, and um, this one, message two, and this one, invalid number, all of those messages are conditional um, on certain things happening in the if statement. These statements don't get executed at any other time other than when this condition is true. This Boolean condition that we have here is evaluated to true. They can't execute at any other point in the program. So they're very much conditional on each branch of the if statement evaluating to true. And only one of them will evaluate to true we can't fall into two branches of that if statement in, in the one program execution. Only one of them will happen. So if the first one happens, the first message gets printed and then that's it. That conditional block is finished. If the second one um, is true, we'll go into that one and so on and so on. So it will actually evaluate each branch of the conditional block, each branch of the if statement in sequential top-down fashion and when it goes into one of them that's it that branch is executed and that if block is finished okay enough explaining let's go back out to a terminal window and let's execute the program and see what happens okay so let's go back out to um our terminal here and we'll execute this. Let's compile it first because we've changed the code around a bit. Um, okay, oops. Example tree Java. And then we'll execute the program. So again, we're still prompted to enter in a number. 
if I enter in the number one, you'll see that we get message one printed to the screen and we also get end of program. So in this case, I enter the number one and this part of the if statement executed and we got message one and then that if block was finished with because we went into one of the branches and we get this final system output down here which was end of program. If I execute the program again, so if I execute it again and I enter in the number two, we get message two. How did that happen? Well, was number equal to one? No, it wasn't equal to one. So we did not go into that part of the if statement. Was number equal to two? Yes, it was. I did enter the number two. So we get this system output message that prints message two to the screen that executes and then we're finished with that if block that that's it. it it doesn't evaluate any more expressions it just prints message two finishes the if block and goes to the next uh, statement in the program which was end of program if we run it again you'll see um if i run it again and this time what i'm going to do is enter in the value 100 okay so what will happen this time is it will check to see if it's one no it's not one it will check to see if it's two no it's not two it's some other number so it's 100 it's not one and not two so this particular input will be captured by that else part of the if statement at the end and it will fall into that part of the if statement and print invalid number so you can see it prints invalid number and you can see over here in our code um, this else part of the if statement here has been executed this time and we get invalid number followed by end of program uh, so you can see that over here we get invalid number followed by end of program so you can see that using this conditional block in our program we've actually created a single program that has three different courses of action okay so that's the power that the if conditional block gives you in Java and in any other programming language for that matter. So this, this conditional block now allows us to write a single program that can actually have different courses of action depending on input or some other event that happens and that will change the course of action in our program. So this is extremely powerful um, and allows us to build more complex programs now. And the next set of videos will expand on this idea and build more complicated conditional blocks. And we'll go through some more examples on how to build conditional blocks in your program. So if you found this video useful, please subscribe to the channel, um, like the video. And if you have any feedback for me, please leave some comments down below. Thanks a lot for watching.